all of you guys will come in from outside, we'll start church. Nobody's <laughs> coming to church today. Good evening, everyone. Let's take our songbook this evening, please, and turn to page number 175. It's just like his great love. Amen. Page number 175. Let's all stand this evening as we begin the service and lift it up as we sing this evening. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true, and never fails how it is tried, no matter what I do. I've sinned against this love of His, and when I get to sing clouds roll away it's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away it's just like Jesus to be today by day it's just like Jesus all along the way it's just like his great love Sometimes the clouds of trouble be in the sky above. I cannot see my Savior's love. I doubt His wondrous love, but He from heaven's mercy see, beholding my despair.
let me say, let me ask you on this last verse, let's show a little enthusiasm, okay? Lift it up as we sing, amen. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine, of all his care and tenderness for this poor life of mine. His love is in and over all that will Just like Jesus all along the way, it's just like His great love. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Great singing this evening. Let's look to the Lord in prayer as we anticipate um, His uh, moving amongst us this evening. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would continue to bring folks in here this evening and that uh, your house will be full. I pray that you will work in the hearts of those that have been uh, witnessed to and invited. I pray that you be glorified, Lord, in our hearts, our personal hearts, that we would be stirred, Amen. convicted, humbled Amen. ourselves before thee and repent. And Lord, I pray that you would really work in this community beginning here with us. Pray that you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. And turn to page number 202. I've got a little commentary that if you don't mind, take a, I'll take a minute or two to do on this song this evening, My Redeemer. And uh, I never really thought about where the song came from, but I would like to read it to you this evening, might take a minute or two, but my Redeemer, he said, I will sing of my Redeemer is one of those hymns that are simple, but yet it's a beautiful song. It's a song that I have come to love since I first learned in a choir a long time ago. The words of this song came from the pen of Philip P. Blitz in 1876. And music was composed by James McGranahan in 1877. The song, this song will have been lost forever during a train accident, which caused Philip B. Bliss death. He had survived the eternal Christ, the initial Christ, excuse me, but met his death when he tried to rescue his wife. The words of this song were found in his belongings later on. After, after an interesting incident related to this song is that it's one of the first ever songs to ever be recorded. During the demonstration of a, of a phonograph, a Thomas Edison invention in New York, George Stibbins made a recording of this song, and George Stibbins was one of the most famous musicians and evangelists of this time. I tell you, when I read that, I cried. I really did. I, and, and the reason the reason I did is because how God brings things our way. You never know what God is going to do. Page number 202, My Redeemer. Lift it up as we sing. sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me on the cross <laughs> Tell the 
number three 296 296 just before the special music 396 oh i'm doing this wrong i'm sorry that's uh that's 296 i'm sorry <laughs> did i say that got it looks like i got a little mixed up there hang on i'm coming okay Savior, I will go for where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. After where he leads me, I will follow, follow on, walking in his footsteps till the crowd be won. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I will follow. sweeping and the dark waters flow with his hand to lead me I will never never fear danger cannot take me when my Lord is near follow, follow. I will follow Jesus anywhere everywhere I will follow on follow
this room. We're going to have an offering this evening as the ushers to come, if you would. This evening's offering will be a love offering for our speaker and his wife. We appreciate their traveling um, from distances and bringing the, the, the travel trailer. And that all costs expenses, and I appreciate your uh, partition, participating in uh, worshiping in this way. You know, probably I should wait until after the message and get some conviction going, but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're going to have the offering now. Brother Merlin, please uh, lead us in prayer. specials here tonight, and to start us off, uh, Miss Marjorie is going to bring us forward. There are a couple short here tonight. Carol is...
still recovering from surgery. And Melanie usually plays this song for us. She was our expert pianist, but she's down in Florida in college. So we opted for adapting it to a acapella version. song a singing there's a little song little song singing in my heart there's a little song little song little song a singing cause the spirit of the lord is in my heart there's a little song little song little song a singing there's a little song little song singing in my heart there's a little song the song, the song is singing, cause the spirit of the Lord is in my heart. There's a little song, the song, the song is singing, there's a little song, the song singing in my heart. There's a little song, the song, the song is singing, cause the spirit of the Lord is in my heart. Every time I feel the spirit moving. Just every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I sing with praise. There's a little wheel a-turning. There's a little song a-singing. I can feel the Spirit moving in my heart. I feel the Spirit moving in my heart. Wow. Praise the Lord. Spoke in the spirit last night, so we were singing Brother Rick. Yes. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Hallelujah. Good to see each of you tonight. So glad you made that. I'm looking you over. See who's here. We're delighted. Delighted to be with you. Ann Marie and I have been enjoying this ministry here. So grateful for it. And what a blessing. The Spirit of God. Don't we need the power of the Spirit of God in our lives? Well, we began on Sunday morning, and uh, who did we talk about Sunday morning in Sunday school? It's God working, right? And how does He work on work, work, work? How does He work? He works on us. Let's get it straight. He works on us. Then he works in us. Then he works for us. He works with us. And then he works through us. Good. So God's busy. God is really busy working on us. Amen. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Amen. Now, then in the morning worship service, we talked about Jesus. And who, does, who is Jesus able to save? Number one, the religious crowd. He, they need saving, don't they? Then the, the rich people, they need Jesus. Money doesn't satisfy. Some of you are thinking, boy, I wish I had some more. I think I'd be a little more satisfied. But 
I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold, wouldn't you? Amen. Then what was the third one? Yeah, Jesus saves reckless people. Yeah, that woman at the well was reckless. Yeah, then uh, the what? The restless people. Yeah, that's the maniac of Gadara. Yes. And then the, the relentless one, that was Saul of Tarsus, made havoc of the church until the Lord got a hold of him. Amen? Amen. We're in, we're in uh, Sunday school tonight, right? Amen. And then last night, what did I teach you about last night? The Holy Spirit. And give me the six works of the Holy Spirit. He convicts us. Thank the Lord for the convicting power of the Spirit. Number two, he convinces us that we need to be saved, doesn't he? Yep. Then number three, he converts us. He changes us. I'm a new creature. Then he, he confirms in us. Your spirit bears witness with my spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. The confirmation. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit never leaves me alone. <laughs> Can you get an amen out of that one? He, he works on us, doesn't he? And he does just what Jesus wants done. Amen. And then he conforms us to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then what does he do? He comforts us. Amen. So we've seen God, we've seen Jesus, we've seen the sweet Holy Spirit, and now let's talk about the spirit of man. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Luke chapter 9. That was a great special song this evening. Amen? Wonderful. And then the one about the spirit moving moving in the heart. And I was like, those two songs were absolutely perfect for my message. I mean, you couldn't have picked two better songs than that. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. In the book of Luke, chapter 9, we begin in verse 1. Then he, that is the Lord Jesus, called his twelve disciples together. Notice, he gave them power and authority over all what? Devils. Imagine that. He gave him power and authority over devils. And, number two, to cure what? Diseases. People with diseases. Number three, and he sent them to what? Preach the kingdom of God. Number four, notice to heal the sick. And he said unto them, take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, Neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and hence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when ye go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed, and they went through the towns preaching the gospel. And healing everywhere. Wow. That's exciting to me. That the Lord would choose us. To choose the disciples. To do these four things. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I'm asking you this evening to bring the message right home to each one that's listening. May we not think about our brother or our sister, but may we think about ourselves. May it be a selfish time where we think about who we are in our standing with God and what kind of a spirit do we really have in your work for our great God in 2020. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Heard a little story about this preacher that went hunting with the dentist and the veterinarian. And they went out to get a big buck is what they were going for. 
Man, they had their licenses, they had their ammunition, they had their guns. And they're standing there on this old country road and they're getting all geared up and loaded up. And about the time they get their guns up there, ready to go, to hit the woods, out of a clearing comes this great big buck. And I mean, these three fellows, they didn't waste any time, man. They picked up their guns and they, I mean, they shot at that big buck and down it went. I mean, it didn't even run off. It just went down. About that time, the game warden comes driving by. He said, I heard, heard some gunshots. What's going on over here, fellas? He said, we just got this great big buck. And he said, who shot it? He said, all of us did. Now, we, we don't know really who killed it, but maybe you would know being, you know, a game warden and all. He said, let me go down and look. He said, I've got some experience in this thing. And he went down and, man, he examined that buck and looked all around and came back and he said, the preacher got him. He said, well, the veterinarian was like, what do you mean? It was, how do you know it was the preacher? Could have been me. The other one basically said the same thing. He goes, oh, no, it was the preacher. He said, that bullet went in one ear and right out the other. <laughs> you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that's going to happen when I get up to preach. That it's gotta, it can't just go in one ear and out the other. It's got to go to the heart. And, and I'm not talking about Jesus tonight or God or the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about what kind of a spirit do you have? So it's going to be an examination message, okay? Now, I want you to notice that the Lord Jesus gave these disciples power and authority. Do you realize what that means? That means that they were able to go out, and the Bible even tells us here in this passage of Scripture that they went out and they preached the gospel, and in verse 6, they healed everywhere. So the power of God was on these disciples. No doubt about it. Don't we need that today? We need a church that is on fire for God. I mean, forget the problems. They're always going to be there. Look at the opportunities that God has given to you. Look at the power he extends unto you. Can you imagine Peter on the day of Pentecost? Hey, he was the denier of the Lord Jesus. And yet he was the one that preached on the day of Pentecost. I'm telling you, God wants to use you and he'll work through you if you'll let him. Amen. Amen. That first special tonight really revealed that God is not, he's not wanting to throw us aside as feeble and as ignorant and as dumb as we are as sheep. He still loves us, and he wants to use us. And don't you think the Lord has long-suffering as a part of his character, that he might work with us until we come to that place where the power of God can rest upon us and we can accomplish great and mighty things. In fact, he told Jeremiah, great and mighty things which thou knowest not. If you knew what God had for you, it, it might scare you to death. But I think if you're right with God, it'd thrill your soul. Amen. I want to be used of God. It, don't you? It was Christmas Evans, the great preacher years ago, wrote a 13-point covenant with God, and I think it was the ninth or 10th covenant. He wrote there, Lord, don't let my days be any longer than my usefulness to thee. If I ever get to the place where I'm like, strewed lumber is what he said. Take me out. God wants to use us. And he's got all power. And he wants to put his power upon you. Will you let him do it? Now there's many spirits in the Bible beside the Holy Spirit. There are some very negative spirits in the Bible, I must tell you. The Bible talks about the haughty spirit before the fall. That's the spirit of man. You ever get a bad spirit? 
Every one of us have had that. There's the spirit of Antichrist out of 1 John 4, 3. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. There's the spirit of bondage. It's interesting that Paul told the Romans, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There's the spirit of divination in Acts 16, verse 16. There's the spirit of disobedience. Boy, don't we sometimes get that. The Lord tells us what to do, and we do the opposite. You'd think that we would never be disobedient to a perfect, holy God. Because he's never wrong. I find that when I want to be right, I'm always wrong. It's, a, it's when I become surrendered to his will and to his spirit of obedience that everything changes. Instead of enduring the Christian life, I enjoy it. Instead of putting up with people, I love people. It all depends on what kind of a spirit you have. Now let's take a look at the disciples and how they did. Let's go to chapter 9, verse 12. In chapter 9, verse 12, the Bible says, And when the day began to wear away, the disciples now have been out and about. They've been healing people everywhere. And it says, Then came the twelve, and Jesus is doing his own thing here. He's got a, he has got a multitude of people here. And the disciples came right up to the Lord Jesus, and they said, Send the multitude away. That they may go into the town and uh, country round about and lodge and get vigils. For we are here in a desert place. Since when do we have the right to order God around us? Now, we're guilty of it. I'll admit it. Lord, if you'll do this, I'll do that. I put conditions on God sometimes. Doesn't do any good. But I'll do that sometimes, and so will you. We're, we're that way. You know, Jesus is such a long-suffering Savior. Notice what he says to the men. I like this. And he said unto them, Get, Give ye them to eat. <laughs> You've got the power, right? You've got the power. Give them to eat. I don't have a problem with you. You don't need to send them away. Just give them to eat. And they said, we, we have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. And they that were about four or five, no, there were 5,000 men there. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down by fifties in a company. Now, can you imagine how long that must have taken to get that done? Notice. And they did so and, men, and made them all sit down. Then he, that is the Lord Jesus, not the disciples, they took the five loaves and the two fishes and looked up to heaven and he blessed them and he broke them and he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did all eat and were all filled and there, were, there was taken up of the fragments that remained to them twelve baskets. One for each of them to have to carry home. Isn't that good? I want, to, I want you to write this down. Number one, the disciples had an inconsiderate spirit. Lord, send them away. They're an irritant to us. We want them to just go get something. We don't want to have to fool with them. You ever have an inconsiderate spirit? There's no doubt about it. Every one of us have. We'll make all kinds of excuses why we can't reach people. I even have preachers tell me now, knocking doors doesn't work. I always say to them, if you don't do it, it won't. It's never worked when you don't do it. People make excuses why they don't do what God wants them to do. And the truth of the matter is, it has nothing to do with the method. It has everything to do with the spirit. Amen. How do you, how do you talk to people unless you go to where they are? 
I was looking for a part, a little teeny part for our door, screen door. And so I went to the shop right down the street over here. And then, uh, and then he said, you need to go over by, by the Sunoco station. There's a place right there. They, they'll take care of you. And I walked in there. The guy that owns the place is Jay. And uh, Jay said, you know, I think I have one of those. And so he went and found it. And, and he said, oh, I'll just give it to you. He said, but you got to pray for me. I said, you know, I can do that, and I'll do that right now. Amen. And I bowed my head, and he bowed his, and there was a fellow that was working there. He bowed his, and we had a prayer meeting. Amen. Amen. And I said, well, I'm going to put this thing on my screen door, and when I, when I think of it and I'm using it, I'm going to pray for you, Jay. He said, amen. He said, I love the Lord. I said, praise the Lord for that. Amen. amen. People are all over the place. But how often do we never talk to them? Oh, we may say, how are you doing? But we really don't care how they're doing. I was with a group of people one time, and they, they, uh, somebody said, how are you doing? I said, I, I'm on the verge of committing suicide. <laughs> they said, amen. <laughs> they didn't say amen. They said, okay, and off they walk. People don't care about anybody else but themselves, really. Even Christians. We can get an inconsiderate spirit so quickly. When you get a door slammed in your face, I've, I think maybe I've had five or six doors slammed in my face in all the 40-some years I've been in the ministry. Hey, Amen. That's good. That's not bad. People have been pretty nice. But once in a while, that'll happen. And uh, so, that's their problem, not mine. They just weren't ready. But you've got to go to people whether you know whether they're ready or not. I mean, if you knew somebody was ready, you'd just stop. If, if the Lord told you that, that house right there, somebody's ready. You'd, you'd stop and go right in there and you'd have a great victory, wouldn't you? But no. When you're inconsiderate, God's not speaking to you. Think about that for a minute. When you get so wrapped up in yourself and you're inconsiderate of others, God can't even talk to us. Sometimes parents can't talk to their kids. Well, God has kids. And I'm looking at them. And sometimes we are inconsiderate. And that's a bad spirit, isn't it? Oh, may God forgive us. May we never think down on someone or think less of someone or think that we don't have the time to care about their soul. Number two, the second spirit we find of the disciples is found, turn with me if you would there to verse 28, same chapter, verse 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and James and John and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. Now, can you imagine that? Can you imagine being just one of the three of the 12 that's with Jesus? And he is praying. And the Bible tells us that he, his raiment became white and glistening. The power of God had come down on the sun. And it was a beautiful sight. Watch this now. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. Moses and Elias, they're Old Testament prophets. What are they doing in the New Testament on the Mount of Transfiguration? Would you be thrilled to be there to see these men? You would be like over the top excited about that. Watch this now. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease which he should accomplish at Jerusalem but Peter and they that were with him were heavy with what they were heavy with sleep I call this the indifferent spirit the indifferent spirit oh wow once in a while you know people fall asleep when I'm preaching now I totally understand that um, I always figure if, they're, if they look like they're sleeping, they're really praying for me. 
That's what I really like to believe, that, man, these people are interceding for me right now. Well, not with Peter. He was gone, man. He was sleeping. And they were missing this. They became indifferent to spiritual things. You ever get bored with a message? It's hard to get excited about it with your Bible closed and your pen in your pocket and you're sitting there saying, bless me if you can. I'm tired. You ought to just thank God I'm here. That's an indifferent spirit, isn't it? Right? Ah, you don't know what I'm going through and nobody understands like I understand. We make all kinds of excuses for our indifference. Boy, that was a lousy message he preached. We don't like messages that convict us when we don't want to change. And we become indifferent to it. This is a sin that these men had. They fell asleep. That's not the only time they fell asleep. You remember, remember when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane? Sweating as it were great, great drops of blood and... And they were sleeping. Could ye not watch with me one hour? Jesus said to them. So he knows that we become indifferent. When's the last time you were indifferent towards spiritual things? You'll never receive the power of God in an indifferent state. We must repent of our indifference. And being inconsiderate. Then I want you to notice... The third spirit is found in verse 33. So Peter was heavy with sleep, and when they were awakened, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. <laughs> yeah, we woke up, got our good little power nap in. It's so good for us to be here. Isn't that something that Moses and Elias showed up? Wow. Boy, you're glistening, Lord. Have I missed something? Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles. One for thee. You know, we want, we want to put you first, Lord. You know, one for you. One for Moses and one for Elias. Underline that little phrase, not knowing what he said. I call this an impatient spirit. Have you ever said something you wish you hadn't said? <laughs> Every once in a while I've had to go to my wife and say, Honey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I won't ask the men to raise their hands, but you know who you are. Impatience. Blabber mouth. Say things we shouldn't have said. Not knowing what he said. Do you realize what he said? He was saying, we're supposed to be worshiping you, Jesus. We're supposed to be worshiping Moses. Got to have a tabernacle for him. And we need to be worshiping Elias. I don't think so. Jesus Christ is the one and only. Colossians makes it very clear. There's none other that in all things, he, Jesus, might have the preeminence. So, did he speak out of turn? Sometimes we get impatient. I remember one time, I, I, had, ta I had taken the church. It was, there were six members. It was called the Ansville Union Church. And the college I was going to said, you can't keep going over there unless you make that a Baptist church. So we went to them and they said, well, we're Baptistic. We have a, two Baptists, two Methodists, and two Catholics. <laughs> wow, this is exciting. And so I told them, I said, I can't, I can't keep, keep coming over here preaching. I wasn't the pastor. I was just filling in. Unless, you know, unless the church is called Ansville Baptist Church. They said, well, we're Baptistic. Uh, we, we believe in baptism by immersion. At least two of them had already been baptized. The other four hadn't. And so uh, we worked on that and I made everything clear doctrinally. And before long, I spent 23 years pastoring that church. And God blessed in so many ways. But uh, I must say to you that uh, God didn't give us the nice building like 
I thought we needed. Uh, for 19 of those 23 years, we struggled with a little puny building that would seat 68 people. And we had double services for six years. And I was just frustrated. And by, by the 19th year, I was like, I don't even want to. Well, the Lord told me this. You know, when you get alone with God, have an all night prayer meeting, God speaks. And I'm laying down here behind the pulpit. And there's about eight other people out there about two o'clock in the morning. And man, we are praying. And the Holy Spirit said, you're embarrassed with the church building that you're meeting in, aren't you? Have you ever thought like saying, how'd you know that, Lord? He knows everything. And I just said, yeah, when preachers come, I, don't, I hope they don't ask me how long I've been here. Because it's embarrassing. And the Holy Spirit of God said, well, who's kept you faithful? See, so many times we're looking on the outward appearance. Instead of looking on the heart. Who keeps you faithful to the Lord? Some of you have been in church many years. You can't take any credit for that. Because if you were impatient, you might have just gotten upset over something and bailed out. But instead, you've been faithful. And through the good times and through the bad times and through the valleys, and you've found God to be sufficient. We must not live our lives off the cuff. We must understand what the will of the Lord is and live according to it. Not get sidetracked, not compromise, not give in to the enemy of the, of the Lord. Don't, don't give in to the philosophies of life. Give in to the theology of God. Stay true to God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. We can't be impatient. We can't have an impatient spirit. Number four. Go with me to verse 37. Verse 37. And it came to pass that on the next day when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, so he's speaking to Jesus now. Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, notice, see the word spirit? There's a spirit taken, taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, that he foameth again, and bruising him, hardly departeth from him. And I, this, this verse right here really is convicting. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. I call that an impotent spirit. You say, yeah, but verse 1 of chapter 9 in Luke tells that he gave them power and authority, right? What happened? They lost their power. I've lost my power with God too at times. I'm ashamed of some of the wasted times in my life where I lost sight of his power and I became powerless, impotent. No power. Just going in the energy of the flesh. It's time to do this. It's time to do that. I got to go here. I got to go there. But there's no joy. There's no power. There's no spirit of God moving me and giving me wisdom because I've already shut down and I'm running in the energy of my own power instead of his power. You ever find yourself there? Impotent. No power with God. Well, I want to tell you something. Jesus has something to say about an impotent spirit. Look what he says there in verse 41. And Jesus answering said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, 
How long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And notice he healed him. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all what? Whenever you see the power of God, it's amazing. <laughs> it's something beyond all of our ability, all of our power. We don't have the power without God empowering us. That's why he said to stay in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. <laughs> the power that we have is weakness. Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. In my weakness, I find his strength. And it makes me go forward. And it helps me to be used of God. And it helped me to accomplish supernatural things. If God be for you, who can be against you? When you have the power of the Spirit of God in your life, you're dead. Christ is alive. And the result is that things happen. I, you know, one thing neat about being a preacher is I never know what's going to happen. I don't. I plan my day and do what I've got to do and everything like that and get to do what I get to do. But God, He always does something. And Anne Marie said just the other day, but we have seen the Lord moving as we've been, the more we witness, the more exciting our life is. And when we don't witness, it is, it's not quite as exciting. Isn't that something? And if I don't have the power of God, how can I be a witness like I ought to be? Correct? Yeah. We've got to take every opportunity that comes our way just so that the power of God can be used Use his power for his glory. They were an impotent, spirited disciples. Then I want you to go to verse 46. How do you think the disciples are doing tonight? Not too good. It's not going very good for them. They've really dropped the ball. They've really dropped the power of the Spirit of God in their life, haven't they? Let's go to verse 46 and see if they do better. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? <laughs> you are kidding me. Let me read that again. I must have read that wrong. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? Really? I call this an inflated spirit. So far, they've been, they've been bombing every opportunity that's come their way, correct? And now they're going, you know, John, I, I wonder if I'm going to be greater than you in, in the kingdom. Well, I, I think I would be. I'm closer to the Lord than you are. And they're, they're going back and forth on who's going to be the greatest. There's none great but God. I think it's such an honor to serve the Lord. I, 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 I couldn't dare quit serving the Lord. And I say that respectfully. Because I know it's not me that keeps me going. I'm simply saying to you that I can't quit because I'm not my own. My father started five churches, raised five boys to serve the Lord. Ten of his 16, ten of his 16 grandchildren are in full-time Christian service. I think he was a great success, but he didn't. And uh, I think he was in his fourth church, fifth church, the church he started in Florida. He got so discouraged. He thought it would be the easiest church to start. All those snowbirds come down and help him. Many of them are deadbeats. Well, we served up in our church and you know, we're retired now and they didn't do anything. He got so discouraged that he decided he was going to quit. Shut it down. Give it up. These people don't appreciate me. I don't know what he was thinking. 
But he went to a preacher's meeting, and man, some preacher got up there and skinned him alive. I mean, put it to him. And he was sitting there bawling like a baby. The Holy Spirit had said, if you're going to quit, you've got to call all your kids that are serving the Lord and your grandkids that are serving the Lord and tell them you're quitting. How would you like to do that? How would you like to go back to the few people you do have and tell them you're quitting? You've got to let your wife know about it. I'm, I'm going to quit. You heard about the young couple that were, he was, they were pastoring for a while and the pastor said, man, I, you know, these people don't appreciate me. And man, these things aren't going the way I thought they were going to go. And he said, I'm quitting. She goes, you haven't started yet? <laughs> it's always different when somebody, there's always a different perspective when your wife's looking at it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And uh, so uh, my dad said, I can't quit. And then he really broke down and cried because he knew that the Lord had renewed his vision, took away his inflated spirit. I was preaching in a church one time. I won't tell you which state or which preacher. But when I got there on Saturday night, he said to me, I deserve better than this. These people don't appreciate me. I thought, wow, I know who I'll be preaching to this week. <laughs> but every night that preacher was in tears. He was wiping tears. On the last night of the meeting when I was getting ready to leave, he said, Brother Knickerbocker, he said, I can't believe these people have put up with me. His spirit was renewed. He got rid of that inflated spirit. And then God could use him again. The last spirit is found in verse 54. Would you turn there? Verse 54. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Lord, we know that those people don't quite agree with us, and since they're not with us, would you like me to just go ahead and call down fire from heaven and consume those people? I mean, I've really been looking forward to this opportunity. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There have been a few times in my ministry that if I had had that power, there would be some crispy Christians. Okay? Uh, people that are just a, uh, they're, 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 they're called sandpaper people. And you've got to love them just like all the others that aren't sandpaper people. Look what Jesus says to this man. He turned and he what? He rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. You don't even know what kind of a spirit you have. I call this one an intolerant spirit. I don't have to put up with this. Woe is the Christian that says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I would like you, the next time you want to say that, don't forget to finish the phrase. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Not even God. Because when you say nobody's going to tell me what to do, the very first one that will tell you what to do is the Lord. He beats everybody to the punch. Always. I can't get away from the Holy Spirit's convicting power. Amen. You can't get away from it. If you're truly born of the Spirit of God, the very first thing that's going to happen is you're going to go, ooh, I can't do that. <laughs> oh, shucks. When the Spirit of God moves upon you, it ought to so humble you that you would not 
be intolerant. See, it's easy to be intolerant with men, but we get intolerant with God. Why haven't you done something yet, Lord? There was a church that I was in. <clears throat> one, of the Sunday, one of the adult Sunday school teachers got mad because the other Sunday school teacher's class was bigger. And some of the people that had been in his class went over to the other class. And he wasn't happy about it. And he made it known. I don't think that, you know, that, uh, you know, you should be, you, you should have that large class. And I, I had one thought that came to my mind, and maybe it came to yours too. Why don't you go build a class? Why don't you... And he had a bigger, bigger area of classroom, but that, that other fella had more people. And I got thinking, all he'd have to do is just say, Lord, I want to fill up four rows. Do you think God could help him do that? See, everybody wants to live off somebody else's legacy. I'm going to ride this one, man. No, you're not. No, God wants you to establish his power in you to where you can build a class. You can make a difference in your church as a member. You can help your preacher accomplish the things that God has set upon his heart to do. Amen. And that's what we need. We need to quit looking for you know, cheap ways to get out of serving God. We ought, to, we ought to say, Lord, whatever it costs me to serve you, I'm willing to do it. No matter what it costs. No matter how hard I may have to work, you're worth it. Amen. Oh, listen, these men should have said, you know, Lord, could we just take a moment and pray for these other people over here that I, that I wanted to strike down with fire? I think we ought to pray for them. Don't you think the Lord has said, you learned the lesson. You don't even know what manner of spirit you are. But... You're no longer intolerant. Now you're very tolerant. <laughs> You'll go the extra mile with people. Why? Because it's Jesus in you. Only he can take you that extra mile. Let's pray together, may we? While heads are bowed and eyes are closed. What do we do about this spirit business? These different things that these disciples failed in. Reveal to us one thing. That instead of being inconsiderate, we ought to be very considerate. Instead of being indifferent, we should be alert. Instead of being impatient, we should go the extra mile. Instead of being impotent, we ought to have God's power. Instead of having an inflated spirit, we ought to be humble. Instead of being intolerant, we ought to be tolerant and love people unconditionally. How's God speaking to you tonight? What kind of a spirit do you have? I'd like us to stand together. The altar's open. As our sister begins to play, the invitation is on. An opportunity for you to come and say, Lord, you know what spirit I have tonight. And I'm asking you to help me. Come ahead. This is a revival meeting. This is a time where God stirs us up, brings to remembrance things in our lives that need to change, that we might be more conformed to the image of Christ. All of us have had these wrong spirits, but we need the power of the spirit of God in our lives that we may accomplish the things that God has for us. Maybe you know someone right now that's struggling with their Christian faith. Why don't you go and help them? Sometimes we watch people get away from God and even get out of church, but we never go to them and plead with them and pray with them and help them. There may be somebody that's away from the Lord right now that you know of. Why don't you come and say, oh God, help me to help those people. Help me to lift up the hands of those who are discouraged and defeated. Lord, what can we do to make a difference in our church right here in LaGrange? 
I believe God wants this church to grow, don't you? I believe God wants to fill this place, not only with his glory, whether it be one or two or two or three or gathered together, there am I in the midst, but wouldn't it be wonderful to have a hundred people here? God's able. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or even think. Oh God, please change our thinking. Give us the power of your spirit like you were given. They were given to the disciples. And oh Lord, may we not waste time and not use those gifts that you've given to us. Those opportunities that are before us. Be with every Sunday school teacher, every worker in this church. Set them on fire for you, O oh God. Give them a desire to want to build your kingdom and to see souls saved and lives changed and those that have gotten away. Oh God, may we go to them with a tear in our eye, a broken heart for them, that they might return and that they might have God's power upon them as well. It could be us that have gone, but Lord, we're here and we want you to use us. Oh, please help us, we pray. One more verse. If God's speaking, you want to come, you're more than welcome, Pastor. Thank you, Brother Knickerbocker. Appreciate. Could he have the mic on? Appreciate uh, bringing the word here out of the book of Luke this evening. The Lord hasn't uh, touched your heart tonight. Your wood is wet. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Brother uh, Withrow, if you come, lead us in one verse of that song, if you will. Page number 278. <clears throat> Jesus is tenderly calling you home. Again. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today. Thank you for being with us tonight tomorrow evening same time six o'clock lord willing we'll see you here with a friend amen and so god bless you you are dismissed <laughs>